Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm just, just to say that I, I'm really, really happy to, to, to be here and to be representing the Portuguese journalists here in, uh, at the Web Summit. So let's talk about iGrowth uh, and how do you build a company with this kind of uh, issues. So when you create a company, you immediately thought, uh, how can I grow and how can I build a, a culture of growing, iGrowing? Mark. Yeah, I mean, I would say actually we started out with the product and making sure that we had something that was ready to grow. And so we spent a long time, actually, you know, for the first maybe three or four, five months, we only had 10 customers. And we spent a long time with them refining the product, getting all the frictions right to make sure that like, there was, it was easy to do the various steps. I think that's really the foundation of the growth. Um, and then sort of when we had something that we felt was ready to scale, then we started to, to, to build in the sort of sales and marketing function properly. And we didn't know how to do that. I mean, we're an engineering-founded company, and we'd never hired a salesperson before, so we had no idea what we were doing. Um, so we ran an, a sales hiring process where we got everyone to come in and give us PowerPoint presentations about how to sell. And at the end of that, we had no idea who was good and who was bad. It was a complete disaster. Um, so then we, we switched mode, and we, we said, um, let's actually see what, what sales actually looks like in the real world. So we went out on the street and started, so our interview process was we would walk into a retailer who'd never heard of Pointy, and the interview candidate would try and sell Pointy live to the retailer, which is, I'm not sure I'd recommend, it was quite a sort of high stakes way to do things, but um, it actually taught us a lot. We learned, learned about like, how to actually do this process. Um, and so that, that was like the very start, and we spent a lot of time refining things since then, so our, our model is now very much driven by digital marketing and, and inside sales. Uh, and that's, that's a very sort of, we, we have a fairly high volume sort of number of sales. We onboard maybe about you know, 50 plus customers every day. Uh, so getting that right is all about, it's quite data driven. It's about like getting all the, like knowing who your potential customers are, making sure you reach them with the right marketing at the right times, you know, sort of giving them a way to, to contact you, answer questions, um, and, and then measuring all of the steps of that process. Like, you know, if, if you follow up with a lead after you know, one hour instead of two hours, um, it's not always actually intuitive. I mean, we found that sometimes like, waiting a little longer is better and all sorts of, all sorts, all these little things about um, making sure that the right leads go to the right salespeople because some people are better at selling to certain types of customers than others. And so that's kind of the easy bit almost when you're at a, a scale like, and there's a, there's a machine to optimize with all these numbers and you sort of just like, tweak all those little levers until it gets better. Uh, I think that the foundation is just starting with the right product, the right sort of frictions, and then the right culture in the team. I mean, a lot of it is driven by the, the buoyancy in the sales team. Like, you know, are they feeling positive? Have you created the right environment for them? Um, and so, yeah, a lot of it is the sort of softer foundation. Um, and then after that, it's, it's about like tweaking all the growth machine. Anika, meritocracy, transparency. How can you create a company when people are engaged with it and at the same time without growth uh, image? High growth image. Um, so I guess so. Meritocracy and design is one of our um, is one of our uh, values, and transparency in, in business and design is a big one as well. So that's where um, for context for people, that's where that's from. Um, I think I'd, well, I'd agree with Mark. Actually, we started um, very much product led, um, and I'm also I'm a product centric founder. So uh, we didn't think about pretty much anything else other than right. What do people actually need to utilize this service? Like, how do we help people out? How do we make people's lives easier? Um, and then very quickly though, we ended up thinking about our cultural values as a business and what kind of business we wanted to be because some people want to be a lifestyle business and that's fantastic. It's a small business, um, you'll hire a certain type of person who's probably quite different to a hyper growth business. And so very quickly we said, okay, we want to be hyper growth. Uh, we want something that's at scale. We want something global because like we love global. Um, I love global. Um, and so then in terms of picking those first people, rather than actually picking um, first employees from the furniture world, which a lot of people thought, why are you not doing that? You know, you, you, I'm not from the furniture world myself. So they were like, you should get people from that world. We said, actually, what we want is just super smart people who are really ambitious and want to take over the world. And that's what we started with. And then over time, we've maintained that culture of only hiring people like that or attempting to only hire people like that. Um, in terms of sales, it's interesting that you mentioned that. So we had the same thing in terms of sales teams. And when we first started a sales team, 
um, not knowing what the hell we were doing in the process. Um, I remember someone telling me, oh, sales teams need commission. And I was like, what? Why does sales team need commission? Who needs money to work? This is crazy. And everyone was like, Nico, you're being insane. Uh -huh. Every sales team needs commission. Uh, and now they have commission and they're great, right? So energetic, all the rest of it. So you just kind of figure it out along the way. But I think you have to start product and core culture of what you want to build. And then everything else, kind of, you figure it out. In yeah. your case, it's the same? In your case? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think, um, especially in high growth startups, it becomes kind of a reflection of yourself, how the culture of the business is evolving. And if you, if you break promises, then everyone else will as well. Promises, when, the problem is when you give a promise, you're creating debt, and that debt builds up over time. So you always have to repay your promises, right? Fulfill them, right? And if you think like that, you need to articulate that. You need to be very f upfront with people on how you think. Because at the end of the day, the way that you react and you behave is the way that other people will behave as well. So if you hold yourself at the highest standard in every single thing you do, not just the, small, not just the big stuff, the small stuff as well, then you can see everyone else in the company as well holding themselves to the highest standard. Mm -hmm. I think there's very specific things like, for example, respecting your time and the time of others, right? One of the greatest assets that we have as, as uh, startups is, and one of the most valuable ones is time. We're all on a ticking kind of Clock. Like mostly of the times you don't have time to... Exactly. So how do, you, how do you ensure that everyone in the business understands the value of time mm -hmm. and therefore going into meetings and then coming out of them and going into a next meeting is not necessarily always the best spend of your time. So if you don't believe that you should be in there, you shouldn't go. You should say, I don't believe I should be in there. So there's these small little decisions that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that if you create that culture where you lead by example on every single thing you do, then I think that boils down to the rest of the company as well, and that helps you with growth. You will burn quite a few times, <laughs> like you will do things wrong, but even being able and humble to say, yeah, I'm, uh, I messed this up, um, and this is what I'm going to do to fix it, that is an example for everyone else as well. So I believe in kind of this more implicit and tacit kind of way of mm -hmm. thinking about it. Is there any country that is um, better to, to enter and to do businesses, or? Any kind of country do you recommend to high scale and uh, to? Uh, I think like <laughs> the interesting thing about different countries, it's fundamentally like you start tapping into different cultures. Right? The way that people communicate in the UK is not necessarily the same as people in Cyprus, where I'm from, mm -hmm. or people in Lisbon, where we have an office at. And I think that's that's incredibly powerful, as long as you're conscious of that and you think about before reacting in certain situations and understand that cultural context. So I don't think there's a clear winner in terms of one market, but I think there's a lot of, it just makes it really interesting um, to kind of try it out in different places. So we've got, um, because of the nature of what we do being very international, we've got a lot of different nationalities in the yeah. team. And I think Alex is right, you, they, people just learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I didn't, like we've, we've just hired three people from the US and the way that they do business, the way that they interact day to day yeah. is just totally different, not totally different, but they're just nuances in the culture that are different to, let's say, um, there's some Italians that we have in the team or French people that we have in the team or British people that we have in the team. And so what you find is as long as the environment is um, cohesive, the culture is very strong in terms of what you want and people are very accepting of everyone around them, then it's, it's fantastic, because then they see, oh, they're doing that, that's amazing, or they're doing that, that's incredible, and you just get this osmosis. So I, I agree, I don't think there's one that stands out, it's yeah. just having the variation is really good. Yeah. Mark? Yeah, I mean, this, the same for us. I mean, like, the, the problems are fundamentally the same everywhere, but the cultural nuances are different and they do matter. Yeah. Um, I remember, like, so we started in Ireland and we started selling to Irish retailers, and then we made a strategic decision to have our second market be the US because we felt you know, it's a very big homogenous market. And we, one of our biggest decisions really was doing the UK or the US first. And the UK is very close to us, but the US for strategic reasons, we said we had to focus there. And US retailers just behave a little bit differently to Irish retailers. I mean, I remember our first retailer in the US 
when he got pointy, he issued a press release to say he'd been selected as the first retailer in the U.S. to have pointy. There you go. Yeah, that's retailer that's would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a totally, like, my head exploded. I was yeah. like, this Amazing. is crazy. Yeah. And they're more enthusiastic, but the, their, their expectations were also higher, you mm -hmm. know? And so, you know, they, they, were, they would engage faster, but expect more. And, like, yeah, there was definitely differences. And we did have to learn how to navigate the market and speak the language. You know, not massive differences, but they do yeah. matter. Yeah. So. I think the U.S. is, is probably... It is different, um, and we Why? found the same thing. It's just um, people are quicker at um, trying something out. There's, there's less fear of failure, um, mm -hmm. and I think that penetrates, you know, from like when people are little and they have kids, yeah, and yeah, you know the yeah. kids are up on stage when yeah. they're five, yeah. talking about how great they are in school. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. It helps a lot. The, yeah, the confidence that grows. People just worry about failing less, um, yeah. and you see that in the customer set as well. So we had the same thing where like customers are excited that we're new versus oh, or oh, we were new versus yeah. oh, you know, can I try you out? Who else is using you? Let yeah. me make sure yeah. it's safe. Yeah. And so, but it does mean they have more expectation. Mm -hmm. um, it's more expensive to do business there as well. Mm -hmm. So you need like a decent amount of funding to do it yeah. um, and um, they can switch as well quicker yeah. um, so there's just more options around so it's it's a great market if if you want to like go for it basically That's do you true. add mentors in this process of growing and scaling mm -hmm. and who are you've, them you've got people around you that you trust and trusting for me at least trusting means that they will tell me exactly whether if they think I'm a um, the truth. Yeah, they will <laughs> give me the hard truth, and, and that helps because when you respect certain people, getting that, like a lot of times you're constantly in it, right? So you will overstep, mm -hmm. you will go the wrong direction. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it boils down to like being willing to try things out and doing that in a way where you're not kind of destroying people in the process. Because it's, it's, it's really important to remember that once you're a founder of a company, when you get to like 20, 25, 50, 100 people, you have a big impact on their lives, right? So how can you make sure that whilst you're testing your assumptions on culture and all that kind of stuff, like how can you make sure that there's a safety net? Uh, some of my guys have an emoji that they can send me when I'm like too pushy. And the minute I see that, I'm like, OK, I open the boundaries. I'll pull back, right? Like, <laughs> it's like a safe word type of thing. Um, I don't do it. They don't use it that much lately. Um, but <laughs> it, it is like those kinds of things. It's, it, it's a small thing. Mm -hmm. But it can fundamentally change a lot of things. Um, so that's kind of my approach. Mm -hmm. um, Who are your mentors? Mentors. Um, <laughs> so we've got a really good board. and. Um, really good investors that I think is quite, un I mean, everyone has great investors, or everyone has to say their investors are great, but I actually think ours are, ours are pretty good. <laughs> um, and so I don't, I'm, I'm less of a, uh, I always get the question like, do you have a female mentor, for instance? Mm -hmm. It's a common question that because I'm a woman, I get asked. Um, I actually don't have mentors, but I have people that I've worked for before that I know really well mm -hmm. who've invested in the business. And when I'm stuck on something, I'll go and ask them a question rather than having this constant check-in cycle, um, which I think a lot of people traditionally think of mentorship. It's more, I've got this problem. I don't know how to run a sales team slash what salespeople need, yeah. who get, get sales. Oh, I used to work at Zoopla. Alex, who's a founder of Zoopla, um, has like nailed it in terms of sales teams. Go and ask him a question. Um, and spend an hour with them. So that's like it's plugged in a different way, which is more problem solving versus just mentorship generally. Because there's just too many. You, you have to be everyone's time. Any any good quality mentor is really time poor. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be to the point and like what is it that we can actually help with? Do you choose them or are they? It's, they as it, it's people that I work. So it's people that I work. I used to work at Zoopla. Uh -huh. um, so that's and I used to work with the founder. So then. Um, he has kind of become a default mentor through that, but he wouldn't say I'm Anika's mentor. He'd say, yeah, I'm one of her investors and I'm helping her out, you know? But they so, help you. Yeah, exactly. In the same, the same way. Mark? Very, very similar for us, actually. So I wouldn't say that we have explicit mentors, but we do have a lot of people that we bounce ideas off and get advice from. Um, some of the most important, actually, are other founders. So I think once a month or so, or once every six weeks, we have a, a sort of founder meetup where we just sort of have a, you know, no holds barred, you know, what's going wrong, tell me the real story, you yeah. know, share the pain, and that's incredibly useful. Uh, and, and we learn things from each other. I mean, it's partly emotional support, but it's also partly like, you know, sharing knowledge, you know, this, this company is better at this than we are, you know, kind of exchange stuff. And then there are some people who are more like mentors, you know, some, some our investors would put us in touch with certain people, we have a few advisors. 
Um, but uh, but again, the, the, the people who are the sort of you know at, at those higher ranks again are often very time poor, and so I think it's um, I'm my co-founder actually, like we sort of mentor each other in a sense. <laughs> yeah. Really. You know, um, so just that um, it's more the it's more having people you can talk to um, more than I would say mentors as such. Mm -hmm. What what were the the best lessons you learned in this process of building a, a company of one or two people to to a high scale company? Too many. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> Too many. A lot of lessons. Um, Let's talk about it. The lessons. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't know. That's a really good question. There's just, I mean, every day there's a lesson. There's something that happens. It's yeah. new. You, yeah, yeah you I think every single day, every day something happens. Yeah, and, and it's not, you know, something bad happens, but something happens that teaches yeah. you something. Um, I think, I don't know. Well, patience was something that I never had. Patience? Yeah, yeah I never had patience. Now I'm getting better. Um, <laughs> I haven't learned that Then one. having those hard conversations, like when you get that gut feeling that something's going wrong or some person mm. is like struggling or whatever, have that hard conversation as soon as possible. I think mediocrity is, is really the, like there's a saying, mediocrity is the result of hard conversations that never happened. Mm. And I think that is absolutely truthful. Right? A lot of times, because we not, most of us don't really, well, not most of us, but when you're a new entrepreneur, right? Like you don't really have that much experience. So a lot of these things you kind of have in your mind and you're not sure about it. Um, so really having those hard conversations and making sure that every single person that is in the team, their personal ambition of where they want to get to is aligned with the role that they're playing. Because the minute you have like a discrepancy between those two, then it's not good for them because they're wasting their career in an environment where they can't get to the next step. And it's not good for you either because it has an impact on the culture and the team. So having those conversations early on, I think, is a... Is it difficult to, to manage that two things, your interests and the, the motivation I think, and... I think, listen, we, we spend a lot of, especially in like high, high growth startups, the people that work there typically spend a big chunk of their lives working. It's just the way it is, and the reason why they choose to work there is because they, they believe that work is not just like a nine to five thing, but it's also like believing in what, is, what we're trying to achieve. So at that point, you, you have quite a, a good kind of alignment between personal and business. But I think other things that as well, like giving the flexibility to people to work from home means that they can spend more time with their people. Right? And if they live abroad, being able to go for two weeks without spending all your holiday mm. to visit your family. Uh -huh. Those are things we, we live in a, in, a, in a time where we can enable these things, but we need to invest in it. Right? So I think doing those kinds of things plays a big role. Mm -hmm. uh, Anika? Uh, uh, Mark? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, a couple of things. Um, so I'd say that the first one is, is like I come from a technical background. So suddenly, you know, thinking about how to manage the organization, manage the people, sort of dealing with this organic entity. Yes. There was a lot of, you know, that stretched me in a lot of ways. It was, it's very interesting, but it's new. And I, I learned a lot about that. And I so there's lessons on that every day. The other one is um, there were some classic pieces of advice that I knew academically before I started. But I didn't. I hadn't like fully internalized them. I didn't know how true they were, right? And so, I'd say the first one of those is is about hiring. So like everyone will tell you, you know, keep the hiring bar high. You know, the, the very best people are ten times better than people who are just good. Mm -hmm. And you know, I sort of knew that. I would I would even give that advice to people, but I maybe hadn't fully internalized just how true that is and like how important it is to like suffer through the pain of not having the person that you need in a key role until you find the absolutely right person to fill that role. Uh, I mean, it's much better, I, I would say, to, to have a gap than have a compromise because you know, it sort of sets the whole standard and everything kind of grows out of that, especially when you're early. Mm -hmm. um, so I sort of knew it, but I didn't know it. Um, another one would be you know, the very classic piece of advice about do things that don't scale. And like, I, I would say that advice to people and yet sometimes I wouldn't follow it. Like, you know, so very early on, I was worried about customer service. I was like, how are we going to scale customer service? We need to automate this. And like, that's, it's, that's the wrong approach. Like, we have 10,000 customers now, and we do high-touch, individualized customer service. And it's the best thing we ever did. You know, like all of our emails, even if it's an automated newsletter, it says, you want to contact us, reply to this email, and we'll like, get back to them. And that doesn't actually take a huge team. You know, and, and their customers really appreciate that. Um, and you know, I think we can keep that going for a lot longer. And um, those things that like you knew but didn't know, those were kind of maybe the biggest lessons. 
Mm. Anika, any advices? Any? Um, I'm just trying to think of the key, <laughs> the key ones. Um, well, I think we've all mentioned it. Like, your company is your people. Um, and again, it's, it's banded around a lot, but it's, I think that the reason why people say after getting to a certain stage with the business is that the people that you hire will make or break your business. And it is hard when fires are burning and you just need a body on a desk doing something to actually calm it down, to think, okay, we'll just hire this person. So I think hiring the best people is, is just really important. Um, and then I think the thing that I personally learned is that people are very different. Um, and one of our culture points to at the beginning of when we started the business was that you know, for anything that we do, people from different viewpoints rationally should come to the same conclusion with all the data points. So if everyone's in a room together, if you've got all the data points for a decision that needs to be made, everyone should be able to actually come to the same conclusion at the end of it, which is like collegiality, it's um, understanding that different people have different viewpoints and that's fine. But actually, what we found over time is sometimes um, that doesn't happen. And actually, it's okay for that not to happen. They'll come to the same conclusion based on what they they know, but not everyone can have every single data point. Yeah. And so having, having a balance of um, trust in different people in different mm -hmm. teams has been something that actually we, we've really tried to foster within the business so that people trust actually if product saying that we should go in this direction, we should go in this direction. If sales saying tiny little things <laughs> like we need music in the office to keep it exciting and the engineers are saying, no, why? It's really like noisy all the time. We don't want yeah, music in the office. It's a actually, teamwork, so. they need it, right? Because for the yeah. goal, for the business, actually, they need energy. And so let's put music in the office. And so that's how, that's been the most interesting thing, seeing um, everyone's viewpoint come together and trying to steer it in the right direction. And what, what's the most, uh, the most difficult thing to manage in a, in a company like yours? in mine, um, is people, it always yeah. is. People. people are the best and the most difficult to manage. <laughs> um, and you know, Alex is right, you've got to make sure that someone's personal interest is aligned to the business interests. If it's not, it just Since the work. beginning and now? Yeah, since the beginning, isn't... exactly. And then over time, you know, we had people who started right at the beginning with us who, um, when we were like a you know, two, three, four, five person team, that even though they were so invested in the business yeah. and I saw them as fellow kind of founders, actually yeah. they just don't scale beyond yeah. a certain point. And that's because their personal interest is speaking to me every single day about every decision that's made, which yeah. you can do when you're a first-person team, yeah. and being a part of this little group that's doing things. And, and so it's just it's understanding that people change, the business changes, and making sure that all of that aligns together. Alex, in your case? Yeah, I think people, uh, people are very weird beings. Um, it's, it's, you kind of have this microcosm, this little kind of ecosystem that you build up. But when you get to like 80, 90 people, that's small villages in Cyprus, right? So everyone has a different perspective. And in our case especially, it's like, well, you've got the engineering kind of part of things. Then you have the highly creative people doing like editorial and social and all that kind of stuff. And you've got people in customer support that are just driven by getting the best for the customer. So you have very different backgrounds and very different profiles. So what do you do? Do you basically say, no, we won't have subcultures in this company? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Or do you say, well, we can, but it needs to boil down to the values that we all need to represent? So there's a lot of question marks there. But it's a, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> like dealing with that, it makes your day different every day. The best advice you heard uh, sometime for, from someone, the best advice yeah. someone gave you. Interesting. <laughs> you have to think. Best advice. Please. On building a company. Like, on we're also obnoxious. Designer. We're like, what advice did someone gave <laughs> us? Um, loads of advice. Um, So many. It's on you, I, mean, I think, like, just don't <laughs> give up. And I, th I think that that's... Um, uh. there you go. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, there's a... Um, like, there are just roadblocks every step of the way, right? Uh -huh. And there's always an opportunity to give up. And so I think it's just, like, believe in it and go for it. And then your, your journey isn't ever going to be that. It's yeah. also not going to be that, which everyone would love it to be. <laughs> it's kind of going to be everyone? like that. <laughs> yes. And when you're doing this at any point, it's shit. So powering through, solving the problem, and then getting back up, I think is the Don't is give probably, up. yeah. And like just knowing it's it's that that's just the nature of the game. Yeah. And any chart that does that, that people are lying. Like yeah. so, just don't <laughs> believe that and think that that's what it is. That's probably the best idea, advice I got from founders who um, run successful businesses. Uh -huh. yeah. Alex, I think for me it's uh, 
it's really that there is good enough and then there's perfect and mm -hmm. perfect is basically your death so stay at good enough um, and try to really kind of educate and, and learn with your team what is good enough for us like you don't need to go to 100% actually it's a, the wrong thing to do a lot of times because it's just constantly changing mm -hmm. right so if you're good enough um, then you can just continuously iterate and get to perfection mm -hmm. very quickly okay thank you thank you thank you so much thank you yes.